thank you for this. Thank you for bringing attention to this. Thank you for sharing your recovery. Uh, as you know, it's a program of attraction, so the more you talk about it, the more you're going to help others. Uh, you make, just made the point, uh, Bobby just made the point that brains heal other brains. That's the way I think about it as a physician. Think about it any way you wish. Think about it as community, as thriving, as meaning making, as a spiritual connection that exists amongst humans. A Jung's name came up. Carl Jung came up tonight already a couple times. I think it was on, your, on the video too. So uh, we're going to celebrate that tonight. Uh, the other thing, uh, let's bring the panel in. I'll introduce everyone on the panel first, but thank you. Thank you. On the panel, you've already met Ralph and Fernando. They are here with us as well. Donna Lotz. Though Cicero, she is one of the filmmakers, Robert Campos, Brandon Wynn, who you've met uh, through the video, as well as his son Dylan, and Tom Wolf, uh, who is himself got, uh, he, you heard his tale on the video as well, right? Tom, of course, is a recovering addict who's been homeless and has been an advocate in California trying to change the insanity of our laws there. Yeah, indeed. So, uh, for, I'll give everyone, a, maybe we'll kind of go across the panel here, give everyone just a minute to sort of introduce themselves and talk about what they think is important to them. I will start. Uh, people that don't know, I worked in a psychiatric hospital for 35 years. I ran a large drug treatment center for 20 years. Um, I understand this disease. I understand it in ways that most physicians don't anymore, unfortunately. Uh, we, I was railing against the opioid epidemic as it began, and I, because the regulatory agencies had been captured, I was punished for daring to say that prescribing of opiates was other than God's work. And literally, that if you didn't treat patient adequately, you would literally go to prison as a doctor. So we'll start on that end and start with Tom. Uh, and what would you like to say? Well, I just. Uh, First of all, I really appreciate that Mr. Kennedy wants to talk about recovery on a national platform. That's something the other two candidates are not doing. You know, in the year 2000, there were 17,000 overdose deaths in the United States, which is terrible. And last year, there was 107,000, 107,000. So it's grown by like a factor of eight. and. Uh, and it's true, we're not doing very much about it. Instead, we're, there's a lot of fighting about drug policy, uh, which way to go, harm reduction, abstinence. The, the bottom line is that we need to really look at a national model for promoting recovery and, and helping to get America healthy again. That's what I'll say, thank you. Dylan? Um, I don't even know what to say. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be up here. You know, I never thought uh, three years ago, or even when my journey in recovery uh, began, that I would be sitting on stage in front of a bunch of people, um, getting to share my experience and, uh, you know, my hopes. Um, you know, this journey through recovery has, uh, it's given me my life back, and I have a family today. Uh, I have a beautiful daughter and a beautiful wife that, uh, you know, I never thought I'd get that chance, and uh, yeah, I'm just grateful, so thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Brandon, Brandon Gwynn. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, same thing, I'll, I'll, I'll say what Dylan said. I, I'm just grateful to be here because this journey started for me, you know, when he was 17 years old, and, and, and the one thing that I wanted most out of all this was to get my son back. And not only do I have him back, but I've been able to step into a world that I knew nothing about. You know, as a dad trying to make a difference, I didn't know anything about anything. And I think that the more that I've been in this line of work, the more I realize I, don't, I still don't know anything. I think the end of the day, if we can all just say I don't know, rather than thinking that we have the answers, because the, the answers lie within the individual. And it, this is an individual journey. Everybody's recovery is unique to them. And if we just spend more time and effort allowing people to find their way and offering them a space to heal and learn and grow together and give that community and support, then we're going to make a difference and have a you know, much, lesser, much longer lasting impact than if we you know, try to do it the way we've been doing the past 20 years. Like, they get better. Our, our children get better. And I'm sitting here today a proof of that because, like I said, I didn't know anything about anything. And, uh, 
here I am today. So thank you, guys. Bobby, I'm going to skip you. I'm going to skip you and go across the panel. Ralph? Thank you. Um, again, like all the other panelists, I'm just honored to be here and thankful for Mr. Kennedy and wanting to talk about such an impactful crisis. I think that um, a lot of other candidates, they you know focus on more comfortable issues that um, that go on here in the United States, and this is one of the most hard-hitting humanitarian issues that we face, and um, like some of the other panelists have said, um, it's an ever-growing crisis, an epidemic, and I know I see it where I'm from, it affects my community, it affects families, um, and it affects home, and I know it does that same thing to a lot of your guys' communities as well, and so, um, it all begins with discussion, and so I'm just very honored to be able to help be a piece of that discussion. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Lo Cicero. I'm one of the filmmakers of the film you just saw, Recovering America. And just one of them. The others are in the audience. It's Robert Campos and Brandon Dumlau. Wave your hands, guys. Really talented people. Um, I'm grateful to, to be up here. I think um, the, the issue is bigger than I realized when we first took this on. It's, it's huge. The numbers are stunning. Uh, over 100,000 people who have died in a year, and then 50 million people who uh, are dealing with substance abuse. This is staggering. This is affecting all of us. It's a huge crisis. And I really hope that this film can be a springboard for more discussion because there's, to talk, there's so much to talk about here. One of the biggest challenges we had in making this film was that there's so much, so many aspects to talk about it, and I'm happy to be part of this discussion, and thank you all to you. Can we recover America, please? At this time? It doesn't matter if you're in a big city or Chicago, New York, Phoenix, San Francisco, Albuquerque, it's the small towns and the small pueblos too as well, whether it's a town of 500 or 800 or 1,200 or 2,000. It's affecting everybody the same. Um, told, I always told myself this, Ralph can back me up on this. I've never wanted to be involved in religion or politics. Once I saw the recovery part of this, I was 100% on board. And thank you for that. Thank you for having this agenda and not another agenda. We need to fix our issues first. So let's start with Recovering America, please. Thank you. So Bobby, what's interesting to me is that for the seven of us up here, we know this disease intimately. This is all sort of matter of fact. What's on the video, what we've been discussing so far, but Donna kind of represents the average American citizen. She's like, what? 100,000 people are killed by this thing? We, we know that and have known that for years. We know all that goes into this and the suffering and the families that are being affected. What do we do? What are you gonna do? I, uh, it's, it, we had in the 20 year Vietnam War, we lost 56,000 American kids. So we're losing almost double that every year from this disease. And you think of the trillion dollars we put into that war and the daily preoccupation on the news, the nightly news coverage for 20 years, the presidential elections that were fixated on it, and it's half the number of people affected that are affected every single year. Our communities are being torn apart. We need to give this the same priority. I'm very reluctant to dictate a government solution. What we found from touring, I wanted to see Every place, and I, I still do this, these are, this is a small fraction of the places that we've actually visited. I wanted to see every place that's doing this right. 
And what we found is there's a tremendous diversity of approaches that are working very, very well. The one thing almost all of them have in common is that they don't have government support. And so I'm very reluctant to get government involved in a way that is going to micromanage places like this. I want to make government support them, and that may be through land purchases and through those kind of contracts, but I don't want government to be coming in and micromanaging. I think this has to be run by NGOs, and we have to use... We have to use a lot of different approaches. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, when he, when he was launching the New Deal, said, we're going to try these programs and we're going to try something, one, one thing at a time, and if it doesn't work, we're going to abandon it and we're going to try something else, but we're always going to be trying something. And, you know, all I can guarantee, I can't tell you right now, that there's one solution or even a multiplicity of solutions, what I can tell you is that in my administration, we're gonna solve the problem because I'm gonna focus on it. And if there's things that are working, we are going to create ecosystems in which those kind of solutions can proliferate. And, um, you know, uh, Bill Wilson, you know, you, you were talking about Carl Jung Carl Jung treated a, a friend of Bill Wilson's who was a Boston millionaire. He was one of the wealthiest families during the Great Depression, and his name was Roland Hazard. And he was a very capable leading businessman, but he was a hopeless alcoholic. And he um, and he went he he was treated by Young, and then he went out, he drank again almost to beat it. He went out feeling cured. He came back, uh, treated again, and then went out feeling cured, and with days he was drinking again. He finally went back to Young and he said, for a person of my, with alcoholism, of my seriousness, is there any chance? And Young, and he said, give it to me straight. And Young said to him, okay, I'm gonna give it to you straight, there's no chance. And then he said, has it ever been done with somebody of, um, you know, of my depth of, of alcoholism? And Young said, the only time that it's happened is in people who have profound spiritual realignments. And, you know, and that conversation was then related by Hazard to Bill Wilson. And then Young and Bill Wilson began a correspondence, which is talked about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But in many ways, that was the central assumption that crafted the spiritual dimensions of the AA program. And the, the 12 steps of, you know, 12 step programs are intended to induce a spiritual realignment, but everybody understands you know, that that has to be maintained and renewed through daily service. And the meetings are actually ways to be of service every day. I came into the program 40 years ago, and I remember asking a guy back then, how long do you have to keep coming to these meetings? And he said, just keep coming till you like it. And I've been going for 40 years every day and I still don't like it. And I go because the, the rest of my life works when I go and I do it the same reason that I brush my teeth. I don't look forward to brushing my teeth. I don't enjoy it. I don't like the sensation, but I don't want to live with the consequences of what happens when I stop. So. <laughs> So as you say, there are various ways that people get to sobriety, but there is one way that's coming in on 100 years of efficacy, particularly when thriving and abstinence is the goal. Full recovery, somebody used that term, I think. And that's the empiric model you've mentioned, the 12-step model, the mutual aid society. There are now our Cochrane analysis, uh, a Harvard professor published a Cochrane analysis that shows that 12-step works as well as any professionally managed interventions. Uh, especially it's superior when abstinence is the goal, except for one thing. It's free, it's available every hour of every day, and why has this been under attack? It's the most shocking thing to me ever. Are you aware that it's been under attack for the last like five years or so? Yeah, I, it's always under attack. Okay. So I, I don't know, you know. And listen, it doesn't work for everybody. 
No, I'm not saying oh. that it does, but it's, it's free, it's available, and it has potential. Yeah. My treatment, treatment that doctors give doesn't work every time. You'll all attest to that, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, and so I love that there are so many other approaches to this and that people are, uh, you know, we visited a place yesterday that had, that just had a multiplicity of other approaches that, that um, you gotta use them all. yeah. You gotta use them all. I'm wondering if you guys have questions for me or Bobby. Tommy, Tom does. Uh. Well, so I just kind of wanted to expound on what uh, Mr. Kenny was saying is that, look, we need all kinds of treatment out there. Uh, and, you know, there, there's, you are right that certain types of treatment are under attack, but the bottom line is, is that 12-step is evidence-based too. So um, the big question is the lack of resources. That's the problem. How many treatment beds are in Albuquerque? Does anybody know? It doesn't match the amount of people struggling with drug addiction. That's right. And that's the same can be said in, do you know in San Francisco we have about 24,000 drug users in our city and we have 500 sanctioned treatment beds for 24,000. And our city spends $700 million. So my question I guess would be to Mr. Kennedy and to Dr. Drew, to you guys, what, what is it gonna take for states, really for the federal government, is it gonna be a federal oversight kind of addiction treatment model that's gonna trickle down to the states or are we gonna have to like kind of just change our whole model completely of how we fund and operate treatment throughout the country to help people get into recovery? I, I, let me just say this, I thought one of the most exciting discoveries that I made during, you know, this kind of exploration that we've been going on for the last 13 months is what happened in Amsterdam. Because I was in Amsterdam at the height of the open air drug markets there and there were 3,000 drug overdoses a year, 3,000. They now, as you saw in the film, have fewer than 40. So they solved the problem. And, you know, we now have, and the great thing is that there are models all over the world for things that actually work, and Amsterdam is doing something that works, and I think that's a place where the government can get involved, because the government can help identify those, um, they can, we can list the protocols, and then we can, we can give funding to local municipalities who are experimenting with those, implementing those protocols, who are experimenting with other protocols and continue to perfect the methods that actually work. But we know what works. I, you know, I talked to the guy, the, the minister who's running that program there, and I said, why isn't this proliferating all over the world? And he said, it is. In Europe, they're now doing this almost everywhere. And he said, I go, what my full-time job is, is now to go from capital to capital and help them put these programs together. And I said, why haven't you been to the United States? He said, I've been everywhere there. And I said, have you been to San Francisco? He said, yep. And he said, it was like talking to a wall. And uh, he said, I told him what would work and nobody wanted to hear it. So, you know, I think one of the roles that government can have is to identify what we know is going to work and then encourage local governments to do those things. And the, what his methodology is, is to use this, this escalation of police and, uh, and social service intervention to force the addict off the street and into, some, into a, a program where he's gonna get help. And then you can use a various, uh, a, you know, a whole a plethora of approaches to recovery and intervention. But the government has a role in actually pressuring the addict, saying we're not gonna tolerate you on the street anymore to do tough love. You're not allowed to do this anymore. We're gonna clean up your neighborhood. We're gonna, we're gonna talk to you three times, and if we can't talk you into doing, helping yourself, you are going to prison, you're going to jail until you choose some other option. And that's what they're doing that works so well in Amsterdam. I would argue that is not tough love, that is rational approach to a life-threatening illness that is progressive, that ends in death. And if you do not intervene, you are duplicitous in negligent manslaughter, 100%. 
Tom, tell me something. If you didn't have some motivation, it's a motivational disturbance. It's a usurpation of the brain's survival systems. So all motivation becomes distorted. And that one priority takes over everything else. So you must create motivation. No? No, you're correct. So for how many of you in recovery here believe that accountability is a cornerstone of recovery? So that, that, that. But first, somebody had to ask you to do something. Right. Tom, get off the street. Tom, let's, I'm going to put you in jail if you don't, uh, you have to be asked to do something. Because we have privileged denial. We have privileged it as a human right. And it is a medical symptom. It is synonymous with something called anosognosia, which is something stroke patients get where they don't realize what has happened to them. In addiction, Tom, did you see what was happening to you on the street? Could you perceive what was going on? I know you didn't feel good about it, but could you really see what was, Dylan, could you see what was happening to you when you were sick? No, not at all, you know. That's I... a condition of the brain. And we have taken that condition in the setting of addiction only. In dementia, when they lack insight, if you don't treat those patients, the doctor goes to jail. If I attempt to treat Dylan when he's in denial with anosognosia, I've broken the law. And we've privileged that anosognosia as, will, as him volitionally living his life the way he, quote, wants to live it as a human right, and it is effing negligent manslaughter. Hmm? I couldn't have put it better. I have a question. So. I think, I think we're, we're all pretty well aware that there isn't enough facilities and there's not enough programs and there's not enough funding. And, um, and, and so, like, I know, you know, I went to six different rehabs within my addiction period. I went to rehab in South Florida. I went to rehab in San Diego. I went to rehab twice in Farmington, New Mexico. I went to rehab in Hernandez, New Mexico, and my last Plus rehab. Kicked out of at least yeah, one. my my yeah. I well, I tried and failed a whole bunch of times, right? And that was part of my journey, the 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 trial and error portion behind it. But um, in the end, and it's funny because I tell people where I'm from in my community, and I say, yeah, I went to Oi Recovery. That's where I was able to plant my feet back on the ground. They say, oh, so Oi is the one that works right and i'm like well no that's the one i chose to work right and so um there's different strokes for different folks um there's not one it's not recovery is not a one size fits all but what i want to ask mr kennedy is what would be your direct plan of attack on addiction well like i said i i I think we need to do, you know, my approach is going to be what they did in Amsterdam, which is to the cities that are really having these problems now of doing very, very aggressive government interventions with assisting, you know, we all know this, that addicts don't come into treatment on a winning streak. <laughs> they, they come into treatment because they hit some kind of bottom. And if they don't hit that bottom, you're enabling them to do it. So I think the government has to provide a bottom for them that is, you know, at a, at a higher floor than all the way going into the sub basement and then find, finding a trap door to go even lower. And if the earlier the government intervenes, the better it is for everybody. So I'm going to figure out ways to do government intervention and then funnel those addicts into all the different forms of treatment and, uh, you know, that are now available and try to keep the government out of micromanaging treatment programs and keep those in the hands of NGOs. And, you know, the one thing the government can do is, uh, is to make Medicaid available for treatment you know, to pay for the beds and then let the NGOs manage the program. So Bobby's referring to something called the IMD exclusion. Yes, is that what you're talking about? And there is a strange history you all should be aware of. We, the Constitution never provided for the, for the federal government to be involved in healthcare, but particularly mental health care. That's why it fell to the states. That's why there were state hospitals. And it was his uncle that wanted to undo that and make a national policy that 
There was a lot to that. He was persuaded by some nudniks to do that. He, he was persuaded by a psychoanalyst who never didn't think addiction existed. They thought addiction was part of the edible complex and that uh, they'd never been in a psychiatric hospital before. And they thought that your uncle could create programs that would prevent addiction and mental illness with these community mental health centers. And the patients were discharged from the state hospitals into the streets. And as you point out, they end up in the prisons, the streets, and the nursing homes, and they don't belong in any of those places. Brandon, are you trying to say something? I, you go ahead. Just you know, a thought here, because you see the demographics of, of people in treatment. It's predominantly 18, 18 to 25 year old white males who have good health insurance, whose family make decent money. Um, how do we how do we switch that? You know, the insurance companies are kind of dictating what treatment looks like and who gets it and how it's done. And you know, what are we going to do to kind of change the disparity in that? To to you know, have a, a recovery available for a larger demographic. To have, have recovery available for a larger demographic, because okay, right now it's, it's very, you know. Yeah, I mean, small. I think we have, to, we, have, we have to get Medicaid to pay for the beds, at very least. You know, there, we met with a group this morning here uh, in Albuquerque who runs an incredible program. I, I think it's called uh, New Mexico Wellness. Can somebody tell me? What is it? Endorphins power. Endorphins power. No. <laughs> Take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, they, you know, they have been able to persuade Medicaid to pay for their beds, because, and it's only $400. They're, they're giving them, they pay, the cost of this rehab is only $400 a week. And it's a very bare bones rehab, but they're treating many, many, many patients and they're doing it very well. And we met a lot of them this morning, the people who had gone through that program. And they were actually go, were able to go to Medicaid and say, here are the costs that these patients are gonna cost you with emergency room visits, with ODs, in the next, you know, several months, if you don't pay for it, and if you do pay for it, it's only $400 a week, and you're gonna save a lot of money, and the local Medicaid office was persuaded. Yeah, part of what, we, um, we, we have weird biases in this country. You know, we'll shut down the world for a disease that killed a million elderly people, but a million young people over 10 years, we're not interested. It, it's crazy. In terms of years of life lost, addiction has orders of magnitude higher impact on this country than COVID ever did. We are blinded by this idea that people are living their best lives when they're doing drugs. Dylan, I wonder if you could speak to that. You know, you're relatively new in the program and you're, you've been on both sides of this. How do you get people to understand how this thing affects you? Um, I mean, I guess just by sharing my story, you know, the, sh the shame and the guilt is what kept me, I, th I think, sick for a long time. Uh, it, it was embarrassing. I didn't know how to, you know, I thought because I was an addict, I was a bad person and that I'd never really amount to anything. Um, you know, and you know, I've been to treatment uh, 15, 16 times, more times than I can count. And... Uh, this last place that I went to, uh, I had an experience with horses, um, a, a godly experience that I'd never experienced before. And I really struggled with the idea of God. Uh, I didn't know how having faith in something uh, would save me. I thought I had to do it myself. Um, you know, and being at this ranch and being with horses uh, just kind of opened my mind and... Um, it just allowed me to, to open up and to be able to express myself. Um, is that, that kind of what you're asking? No, it's helpful. That's, I just want to hear your point of view. Donna, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering, because you're the relatively new to this whole landscape, yes? Uh, no. No, okay, no. <laughs> no, I'm not, but what was your question? The, the, question was, I'm, I w the question was, I wonder if you react to, if you have any thoughts about coming to terms with how this disease affects people. Do you, let's ask this. Do you understand that it is a disease? Oh, my goodness, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How, uh, how so? How so? 
it isn't like uh, the, uh, the, the addiction therapist in the film said where he thought it was just a matter of willpower. It's not that. It's something deeper, it's something trauma-based, it's something that takes a whole realignment, a spiritual realignment. So I see that. And um, my life, my, my parents were both alcoholics. Uh, my brother's an alcoholic. I have a daughter in recovery. Um, and I had a good friend die on the streets of San Francisco. And that was very heartbreaking too. I'm thinking though that uh, I see a sea change. I see a shift. I'm seeing in San Francisco, there's a mayoral race going on and people are rejecting the San Francisco model of treatment right now. There, there's a guy... Tr treatment uh, in quotes. Treatment well, in quotes. Yeah, but uh, Tom Wolf is nodding his head, yes, because he can speak to this. He's, he's right? in the trenches with it. Yeah, so the, the big, there's a couple of things about when you're, like I was, I was homeless and addicted to drugs at the same time in San Francisco, in the Tenderloin. And the biggest thing for me, and I think many people in recovery can look back and say that none of us, I didn't want to die when I was out there, but I didn't care if I did. And that's the disease that creates that kind of hopelessness that you have. So it's really uh, critical for us now as a society to step up and offer the kind of support that we need. And that means funding and resourcing recovery options to get people away from the drugs and get the drugs away from people. That's how you do it. And now, in today's world, with the arrival of fentanyl, it's kind of changed everything because the window of opportunity to do that has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller because so many people are overdosing and dying. So again, it just kind of brings me back to the whole fact that we have a presidential candidate on the national stage talking about a recovery model for America. Everybody should be talking about this because it is the crisis of our generation. I'd like to speak a little to that, to that disease model because as a father, and I think there's many family members and fathers out there that, that probably felt very similar to me. I remember going to my son's first family day in the very first treatment. I was like, they're going to try to convince me that addiction is a disease. I'm not going to go to this thing. I, I, he doesn't want it. He doesn't work hard enough. He's not trying. I was still in that model of shame and fear and guilt, you know, and I didn't know it. That, that day I sat in there with other families and I listened to their stories and I heard other people sharing the same story, that, the same emo emotions and feelings that I had was the day that I started to open my eyes, like, it is a disease. And, and I didn't believe in AA at the time either. It was like, oh, they're just going to try to brainwash my son. It's going to replace this addiction with another addiction. But it was what he needed. I'm not in recovery. I worked the 12 steps. I got an AA sponsor. I worked through the program, and it was life-changing, and it was game-changing for me. So this is work that anybody can do, and we just have to be more open to understanding, like, we don't know. It, this, this is a disease, and like, we have to treat it like one. Yeah, I think, th thank you for saying that. You want to say something, Fernando? The, I was a big believer in being a drug addict was a choice. It was my choice to do drugs when I was younger. It was my choice to traffic drugs and guns when I was younger. But in the last six, seven years, I've come to realize, after talking to certain folks and certain doctors, that it starts with some kind of trauma, whether it's young. Mine was something totally different to what Ralph's was to do drugs. Because we're not just going to wake up one day and be like, oh, I think I'm going to try some heroin one day today. I think today's the day. It doesn't start like that. Like, it, it, we all, I'm not allowed to cuss. We all have demons in our head that we fight with every day. You do, you do, we, you, we, we all do. And if we say we don't, then we're liars. Um, it is a disease. It's not a choice, and it starts as trauma as a young person. At least it did for me, um, and that's how, it, in my opinion now, it's not a choice. But at the same time, it is. So I need to put my doctor hat on for a second and help everyone. If you have to get into conversations or if you're struggling yourself with this idea of it as an illness or a disease, 
you have to do one thing first. You must have a definition for what a disease is. And then you can sit back and go, does addiction fit the definition of disease? And strangely, I've spoken at universities and professors and fellowships and in, in medical settings, and they don't have a definition for disease. So I actually had to come up with the definition, which is the following, and you'll see how it covers all diseases. It is a complex relationship between the environment and the genetics of the individual. That relationship results in an abnormal state of physiology. We call that pathophysiology. That pathophysiology is reflected in signs and symptoms. Those signs and symptoms are something that a doctor can see and then infer the abnormal biology. Those signs and symptoms, we know from studying those signs and symptoms that they will follow a predictable pattern. We call that a natural history. Sometimes that natural history is a resolution if it's a cold. Sometimes the individual will die if it's certain cancers. Addiction has a very specific natural history. In the case of opiates, it's progressive and it ends in death. And it has a predictable response to treatment, something we call treatment. Where people get hung up is in the pathophysiology, which is in the case of this disease, is in the brain. And we have, and we have several candidate gen genes for where, what the genes are that are triggered and what you all share genetically. And this biology is in the reward system. It's in the motivation system. It's the part of the brain that is responsible for telling you to survive. And the very survival mechanism gets usurped by this biology in genetically prone individuals, not everybody, and it takes over. Often, the environmental trigger is trauma. And now you have two problems. Now you have a motivational disturbance and the trauma, and they both must be treated. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, oh, that's brilliant, and thank you, Drew. Um, I, I, had, I, I had iron willpower when I was a kid. I, I gave up candy for Lent when I was 13 years old. I never ate candy again until I was in college. <laughs> I, ate, I gave up desserts when I was 14. I never had another dessert till I was in college and I was trying to bulk up for sports. And then, but then I got addicted to, to drugs. And I thought my willpower could do anything and yet this compulsion was utterly impervious to any will. And I, I said in that film, to me the most demoralizing feature of this disease was my incapacity to keep contracts with myself. I tell myself at 9 a.m. I'm not, never going to do that again. Believing it, I'd say it earnestly, sincerely, honestly, and then 4 o'clock I'd be doing it. And I couldn't understand why, I, I, you know, people compared it to dancing with a gorilla, you know, you, at first you really want to do it because it looks like fun. And then, you know, you realize that uh, you, you only get to stop when the gorilla gets tired. And, and, uh, and that's going to be when you're dead. And so it was, a, for me, understanding that this was not a moral failure was really important, that this was a disease and I had to treat it like a disease. And it's like diabetes. You, you, you can't think your way out of it. You have to act your way out of it. You have to do what you're supposed to do. You have to take the medicine. If you're, if you're a doctor and you know more about diabetes than anybody in the world, and you don't take your insulin, you're gonna die. So the knowledge does not cure this disease. You have to, it has to be, you actually have to do the actions and for a lot of us, that means going to meeting, trying to figure out a way to be of service to other people, and then you know doing all the simple principles of, of the program, and that is the treatment. Uh, but it is, as, as Dr. Drew said, two of the features of this disease. One is progression, that it always gets worse. I had the idea that someday I'll grow out of this. Someday, you know, it'll just stop, but it never does that. If you have this disease, either from trauma or genes, you have it forever and it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. The second feature is it wants you dead, but first it's gonna make you miserable. And the third feature, you know, a third feature is that 
it is the only disease that is telling you that you're not sick. It's a disease that puts you in a state of denial so that somebody outside of you has to tell you, and this is why it's important for government to do that, to say, you got a problem and we're not gonna let you, you know, have the reverberation of that problem to, to spread from you to the rest of society. We're going to put some guardrails on your behavior and make sure that you can get help for your disease. And embedded in what you're saying, you cannot do it alone, both from the standpoint of the community and in terms of the service. But um, you guys, uh, I'll start with Ralph. One of the, we've been talking about the genetic, uh, oh, did you want to say something for that first, or is, you had the mic? Okay, because uh, you, you, you're also the person I want to get a comment on this from, because it's kind of interesting. We'd say, you know, we, we talk about the genetic quality of this disease. This disease has been in the human genome throughout human history. If it, and it was alcoholism through much of that. We invented all these more powerful chemicals that took over for the alcohol. And yet it has persisted in the human genome. It must have evolutionary adaptive advantages. I've been thinking about that for a long time, and it does. The people who get this disease, it's an incredibly rich population, intelligent population, creative population, and I'll be damned if they aren't the best survivors of all time. They survive in adversity. Thoughts? Ralph. Yeah, there's, um, there's a, a lot wrapped up when you get to the point of, I, I know for me, waking up one morning and accepting the fact that I was an addict was a tough thing. I never, I mean, I grew up, you know, being raised by a single mom and she, you know, was 18 raising two kids in a low income neighborhood and she worked hard to get us out of that environment because she wanted her two boys to have a chance, right? And so we witnessed that we were taught values and we were taught hard work and we were shown a lot of different things and, um, and, I never thought, well, we, I always saw commercials and heard of people saying, oh, look at this person, that person, don't do drugs because you can end up like this and you can end up like that. And then, you know, the peer pressure getting into high school, because um, in high school is when I started to experiment. I started experimenting when I was in high school and I kept saying, no, 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 no. And then that one time, all it took was that one time for me to say, I guess I'll try it. Right? And the minute that I tried it, I can still remember it like it was yesterday, and it was cocaine that I tried. And when I tried it, I said, whoa, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. It's really good, right? And then I thought, well, I'm not like everybody else. I'm me. I'm stronger than that guy, and I'm stronger than that guy, and it can't. Nobody thinks it's going to get them, right? And it starts at some point. But when it does hit, and you get to that point where you're in full-blown addiction, you don't even know how you got there. Because nobody wants to become an addict. Nobody wants to become homeless living on the streets. Nobody wants to be out there trying to hustle for something that they think is going to make them feel better, only to make them feel worse, to hustle even more to get that same thing to feel better, that just made them feel worse. It's a psychological thing, right? Biological thing. But a little bit because of, Because yeah. psychologically, you knew it would make you feel worse, and yet it happened. And, and, and happening. yet, here we go again. There's, there, there, you just fell into the routine, you know? But, um, but it takes a lot. And, and you know, I, 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 I look back at all my trials and errors, and, and, and again, you know, we talked about how it's different strokes for different folks. There's no one size fits all when it comes to recovery, but you know, it's just um, individuals feeling like they have the support when they're ready because everyone is ready at different times, right? Fernando? Um, I have to admit, I was selling drugs before I started experimenting with drugs. I started experimenting with drugs I knew I was in experiment with drugs before I started selling drugs. After seeing individuals on drugs that I was selling to them, 
made me curious to the fact is I wanted to see what it feels like, what my next door neighbor's feeling, because I used to sell drugs to my next door neighbor. Um, what she was feeling like, what he was feeling, whether it was heroin, meth, coke, weed, alcohol. But while in experiment, experimenting with meth, getting addicted to meth, all I could think about was my trauma growing up. Um, Ralph knows my trauma growing up. I've probably told five people in my life what my trauma is growing up, and the only reason I, don't exp I wouldn't express it here is because that person is still alive and I don't need to cause any family issues. Um, and that's all I thought about for the first year and a half that I was now an addict selling drugs to certain people. And we need to fucking fix this, man. I'm sorry. Like, we need to try to fix this. Like, it's not the little kids. It's not the 13-year-olds, the 15-year-olds now. Now it's the 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds that are getting their hands on these little blue pills. Um, so, yeah, sorry for cussing. So, Bobby, we're, we're sort of coasting towards our, our wrap-up here. We're, we're here to support you. We're here to hear your thoughts. I want to give you a few moments to kind of give us your final take on this topic that this panel has been kind enough to come and discuss with you. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about the question that you asked about, you know, what is the selective advantage to to having that addiction gene, you know, in your society or as an individual. And I don't know the answer to that, but one of the do things- Do you know the answer to that? Well, I do too. I mean, I don't, I, here's what I would hypothesize, and I don't, I don't think this is a, a particularly complete answer. I think addicts have a restlessness, they have an empty space inside them that is yearning constantly for something that is willing to take risks that other people won't take. 100%. That, have, that has a sort of a drive um, to, a, a, I would say, kind of a constant dissatisfaction with what they have now. And that actually, that, that very, very negative drive, it can be destructive, but it also can open new horizons and new opportunities that other people would never experience because it's, it's making you do things that are a little bit crazy, that people who, are, who have a, a, a normal risk profile would not engage in. So you could be the one who discovers a new continent. You could be the one that wins the lottery that nobody else would bet on because the chance of winning her is so little. You could be the Ted Turner. If you look at Ted Turner's life, it's just one insane risk after the other, and they all paid off, you know? Great so, fighter pilots, great yeah. extreme athletes, great shortstops, great survivors in extreme circumstances. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's an advantage to it if those quality, those qualities could commit virtues if they're harnessed for a whole society and you see so many um, people who are involved in addiction who are now involved in, in curing or treating the problem with the, all these, you know, this entrepreneurial, extraordinarily innovative ideas that are just beautiful and that bring us together as society to do things that are crazy, like go start a horse farm for addicts in the middle of the American, you know, hinterland, or, you know, giving their lives walking the, the streets among homeless people and dangerous people in San Francisco and saving people's lives. So, I, you know, how do we harness those energies? How do we harness that aptitude, that, um, that appetite for risk and uh, and ha and it all comes with restoring a sense of community in our country. And uh, you know, my job as president of the United States will be to do that, to remind Americans we're all part of a community. The only way that we're going to survive as a people is not by leaving our poor brothers and sisters behind or the people who don't fit behind, but go back and figure out how we include everybody and how we amplify and multiply 
the opportunities for service with each other and, um, and the opportunities to, to, again, to reconnect in community.